before we read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I, man, this verse came to my mind uh, as I'm sitting back in my office and I wanted to read it for you. Uh, I quote it all the time. You know it well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. But I really feel like God's doing something. I mean, eight weeks we've been moving from chapter 12 through chapter 14. Next, next week will be our last week in this eight-part series on spiritual gifts. I really feel like God is using it, not just in individual lives, not just in our church. But I feel like God's doing uh, a lot uh, with this series. I feel like, you know, we've got a lot of cessationist reformed brothers and sisters in the room. And we praise God for you, man. I'm so glad you're here. But, I, but I'm hoping as we eight weeks, we are laboring through spiritual gifts. I, I hope it's moving you from hard cessationism, at least to soft cessationism. Uh, we, we welcome all our cessationist brothers, but at least be soft cessationist, which means the same thing as open and cautious continuationist, by the way, from the brothers that I've been talking to. Even John MacArthur who's written books against the gifts of the Spirit, calls himself a leaky cessationist. Uh, we, we've got to do something. And I feel like in the Reformed Church, we're, we're correcting some misconceptions. And I feel like in the, there's a lot of charismatic pastors watching. There's a lot of charismatic uh, churches studying the study guide that your church put together and wrote. And a lot of bad behavior and bad theology is being corrected in those churches. And, and that's what God's word is supposed to do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. All scripture, all scripture, even the parts that you don't like, even the parts that make you uncomfortable... All scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. We left to our own thoughts, left to our own ideas. We are going to get it wrong because we are fallen men and women. But through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, now we are redeemed and God loves us enough to teach us his mind, his will, his ways and his will and his mind will continuously be correcting us. Right theology leads to right practice. Orthodoxy, the right way of understanding what God says, leads to orthopraxy, the right way of living out and behaving as Christian men and women. We need this, so keep that in mind as we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for the second part of tongues and interpretation. We're going to read the whole thing and then we'll pray, starting with verse 13. Therefore, one speaks in a tongue, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers." If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. 
If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Esta es la palabra de Dios. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Just a little tongues and interpretation for you as we get started. Uh, I was in Quito uh, teaching at a seminary, and it was this book I was teaching, and they taught me how, I was like, I got to know something. that I I don't want the interpreter to say everything. Teach me, this is the word of the Lord. And so that's, they taught me, esta es la palabra de Dios, and I've never forgotten. Praise God for his word. Let's pray, and we'll get started. Jesus, thank you so much. You are good, you are holy, you are true, you are righteous, you are just. You are loving. Father, you love us today. And as a good father, you correct us and reprove us. Father, I pray that you would bring great clarity through your word to your church. Father, so many texts that come from your word make us uneasy, make us uncomfortable. But it's all your word. Teach us through your word. It is in Jesus' name we pray these things. And every Christian said, amen. Amen. So chapter 12, we got these two lists of gifts, and some are, some are very normal, uh, serving and administrating, nobody believes, uh, teaching, nobody believes that those gifts have ceased, but there's, there's other gifts like tongues and interpretation particularly that do make us uncomfortable, and how does it work, and why does it work, and why is it necessary, and what's the point? We have a lot of questions, so uh, sometimes it's easier just to say these things uh, aren't for us anymore, and we sweep them under the rug, never, never truly studying to, to get clarity on, on why these gifts occur. So I want you to remember, chapter Chapter 12, God gives gifts to his people. Chapter 13, all gifts should be used through the medium and motivation of love for one another, which is why chapter 14 starts off, pursue love. It doesn't say pursue tongues. It doesn't say pursue serving. It says pursue love. Love has got to be the oil in the engine of the church that makes everything work. Chapter 13, love is not proud. Love is not arrogant. What's the problem happening in Corinth that this teaching, this correction needs to be given? People have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit and they're monopolizing the service. They're taking the service hostage. They're putting the the spotlight on them. Look at me. Listen to me. Look what God's doing with me. Look how spiritual that I am. Uh, And they're thinking about themselves. But love's not proud. Love's not arrogant. Love's not self-seeking. Love's not self-absorbed. Love thinks about what's good for the brother next to me, what is beneficial and edifying for the sister next to me. Uh, That is what we are to do in the church. We are to use our gifts to build up one another so that through us, the body of Christ can make much of Jesus in the world. That only happens as we are thinking about one another, loving one another as we use these gifts. I want to remind you also before we uh, go back to verse 13, we are to be pursuing love with the gifts. We are to desire the gifts. All these lists of gifts from chapter 12, from Ephesians 4, from Romans chapter 12, from 1 Peter chapter 4. These things are all over the place in the New Testament. These gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us to love one another and to make much of Jesus as we do that. That's the purpose. We are to desire these gifts. We're going to see three times. We, we saw in chapter 12, verse 31. We see it here. We're going to see it one more time in chapter 14 before we get to the end. We are to pursue, to desire gifts. The Holy Spirit gives are good things. Amen. God don't make no junk. God doesn't give any junk. The gifts he gives are good gifts. Change your mind. Be corrected. The gifts God gives, including tongues and interpretation, are good things that we should desire. Verse number two, remember this. Tongues. If somebody speaks in a foreign tongue, whether it's a a known language to someone else in the room, like Italian or Latin or, or, uh, you know, uh, any other language, or whether it's glossolalia, where human fragmented parts of language that that do have a purpose uh, in communication, but tongues is never to communicate with other people. 
Tongues is an upward language. Tongues is the worship. That's why it says when you pray, when you give thanks, when you, when you sing, these things are all upward. Right? When we sing, we're not thinking about ourselves. We don't, we don't sing to ourselves, amen? We don't pray to ourselves. We don't give thanks to ourselves. But a, a, a tongue, uh, from a biblical perspective, is an upward language of worship uh, to God. It's a way we uh, extol God, uh, speak to God. That is the purpose of the tongue. Never for communication from God to people. No, human tongues is our worship of God. It is for the upbuilding. All gifts are for the upbuilding of the entire church. Look at verse 4 quickly. A tongue, uh, the one who speaks in a tongue, builds up, edifies himself. Right? What is the purpose of a tongue? It's an upward language of worship to God that builds up the person speaking in the tongue. But prophecy is a more necessary. It's not better than it, but it is a more necessary gift. In fact, tongues and interpretation, the last gifts on the list. Not because they're less than or worse, but because they're not as necessary as teaching. Not as necessary as someone being sent to plant the gospel and plant a church. Not as necessary as someone who would prophesy in the language that everybody speaks so all can be built up together. So, is tongues a gift? Yes. What is tongues? It's worship of God. It's an upward language. What does it do? It builds up the individual who is speaking in the tongue. These are all things we learned last week. But the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets. Because speaking in the language everybody knows, the de declaring rightly the oracles of God is more useful because it builds up everybody at once. Are we trekking? Let's get to verse 13. Are you excited? Oh, I can tell. You're really chomping at the bit. Therefore, all those things in the recap of the beginning of chapter 14. Therefore, what's it there for? All those things are leading us to instruction, direct instruction about corporate church worship and the use of tongues within the corporate body. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that, underline this, he may interpret. So if, a, if, if when the body gathers together and someone that we're going we're gonna to read a little later, it looks like other people can interpret a tongue as well. But the he may, there is a personal responsibility. Hear me. If you uh, become so overwhelmed in God's spirit that, that you would stand up and interrupt a corporate worship service you and speak in a tongue, you better pray that God gives you the interpretation so that you can share with everybody else what you just said in a tongue so that the whole church can be built up. There is a personal responsibility of the person who speaks in the tongue to, to uh, receive an interpretation. And if you don't somebody else better or the Bible is very clear sit down and shut up because you're interrupting everything and things are not being done in order so in a corporate service where God's people gather together a tongue is used somebody has to personal responsibility somebody has to interpret so that everybody can be on the same page for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving? Now, last service, I'm just going to tell you, they did better than you. Because when I read the text... And I said, esta es la palabra de Dios. This is the word of the Lord. Half the congregation said, amen. Right? Because that's the purpose of a tongue and interpretation. When something is said that you can't understand, somebody's got to tell you what they said so that you can say, amen. Now, now notice when I pray, when I sing, when I give thanks, these are all upward things. 
all, all praise and all, all these things, worship and glorify and honor God the Father, his Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All upward languages. When we're in church and we're singing and we're worshiping uh, and we're, we're giving thanks, it's, it's upward to God. But if we do these things in tongues, we might be edified, but nobody else around us can say amen. And that word amen is an awesome word. Christians all over the planet, right? Universal language. It's a Hebrew word originally, but, but every church, there's two words that every church, no matter where you go, no matter what continent you're on, uh, churches in Africa, churches in Asia, churches in Europe, churches in South America, everybody knows amen and hallelujah. Some, some people say it different, hallelujah. I don't know why the H is silent sometimes, but everybody knows those two words. Universal language. When we come together, we need to hear God's word in our language so that we can say amen. Amen simply is a word that means yes. That is right. So be it. Uh, as we come together, we need uniformity. Uh, we need unification in Jesus Christ. We need to know what is true. We can say, yes, that's true. We need to hear it in our own language. So praise God for the gift of tongues. We're going to talk about the private use of the gift, but in the corporate body, we've all got to be on the same page. So if somebody does speak in another language, it's got to be interpreted. It's not just tongues for tongues sake. It's also with our mind. We got to be together and unified in Christ Jesus. Gifts are used to lift up, build us up so we can lift up Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's talk about this, this the praying in a tongue, singing in a tongue, giving thanks, all upward language. There is, and this is not what Paul is talking about right here. Uh, well, we're going to see a little later uh, that Paul speaks in tongues more than anybody, but we don't ever see, man, we've got Dozens of sermons of Paul. We've got 13 books that Paul has written. There's, he never publicly does anything in a tongue that we read about. But he speaks in tongues more than anybody else. So, so what does that mean? There's got to be a, a private tongue, what, what mo most people call a prayer language. I'm going to show you, there's a lot of places we could go to, to understand and, and unpack this. But we're going to go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, if I pray in a tongue, right, we, we see it here. It's also found in Jude, verse 20. It's found in Romans, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying in the Spirit. Tongues is a gift God gives. It does personally edify a person when used, when you're praying. Romans 8, 26 says this, likewise, the, why, why would this be a gift? Why would God use this still today? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Uh, the King James Version, uh, that, that word groaning can also be translated as utterance. Through, uh, with utterance too deep for words. When we don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit prays for us. What we see is uh, uh, many times this can come through groanings and utterances, a, a language, uh, oral speaking that we don't quite understand, but it personally edifies us uh, because God, the Holy Spirit is praying exactly what we need as we worship God and pray to God and give thanks to God through a tongue. There is, is there a, a private prayer language that Paul uses that is still for Christians today? I think the answer is very clearly yes. And I know people that have this private prayer language in their prayer closet. They get in there and they pray in a language they don't understand, not all the time, but when they don't know what to pray, they're edified because they know the Spirit is praying for them exactly what they need. Of your elders here at Four Points, there's six of us. I know uh, two uh, speak, uh, pray in tongues uh, in their personal prayer closet, but we've never had someone publicly interrupt uh, a worship service. And to be honest with you, I hope, man, I'm not preaching this because I want this to happen. 
Uh, I would be very uncomfortable if somebody interrupted a service with a tongue. And you better believe there better be an interpretation that comes after it or we're going to sit you down after church. We're going to have a talk. People, uh, it's unfortunate. Man, this is true. We're going to preach it just like it says. But at the same time, some people take it too far. I've been to churches where the pastor says, is everybody singing in tongues right now? And they're, they're all just singing in tongues all over the place. Everybody, nobody knows what's happening. Nobody knows what anybody is saying. That's not biblical. It's just not. Man, remember our moniker for these, this sermon. Don't be weird. <laughs> Chapter 11, just be cool. Chapters 12 through 14, don't be weird. Sarah and I were at a conference one time and we were talking, I was talking to this pastor and his wife was sitting there and we were talking about personal devotion time and, uh, you know, personal family worship time. And, and the wife uh, spoke up and said to my wife, she was like, don't you just love going into a room all by yourself, turning on some worship music? She said, I just, man, I, I, I get in that room and I just, I pretend I'm slow dancing with Jesus. Don't you love that? Sarah's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Now, is that, is that woman a Christian? Yeah, there's a place in heaven for weird people. But, <laughs> but here's the deal. We're not going to be hanging out after church. <laughs> it's just a little too much. But why would you not believe and many in, in small groups, you're, there's so many good discussions happening in our small groups. Why would you tell somebody what they do in their private time with the Lord is wrong or unbiblical when it's in here? The Holy Spirit helps us pray with groanings and utterances that we don't know. If I pray in a tongue, if I sing in a tongue, if I give this upward, if there's this upward foreign language that God uses in my personal prayer time that edifies and encourages me, why would you tell me? That it's not there. Why would you sweep this under the rug? You shouldn't do it. It, well, it makes me feel weird. Well, it makes me feel weird too. But you don't sweep it under the rug. It's here. There's, there's text for the gift. However, when we come together in church, there are specific rules that Paul lays down for this church for a public use of a tongue. It's got to come. It shouldn't, it shouldn't hijack the whole service, right? It should just be one, two, three tops, and there has to be an interpretation, or don't ever do it again, because we have all got to be on the same page. That's basically the whole sermon. I got 25 more minutes, so let's go. I'm back on this page. Uh, everybody's got to be able to say amen to your thanksgiving. And listen, the interpretation of a tongue, remember, what are we saying amen to if a tongue happens and an interpretation comes? The interpretation should reveal and communicate the upward praise and worship of God that the tongue is expressing. It's never a message to the church. All my Assembly of God pastors watching, all my Church of God pastors watching, somebody asked me one of the greatest questions last week. Are churches that do this differently in sin? That's a good question. Which is why I need pastors to listen. Listen, there are, there, how, many, how many of you have ever sat in a bad church with bad theology, but God still moved in your life? Right? I've been to bad churches that God still used in my life. There are people, take the Roman Catholic Church, for instance. Man, they got some whack theology. I mean, purgatory, and you can buy your way. It's works-based salvation. You can buy your way, yourself into heaven. Just completely whack. But are there Christians, it, real Christians, who love Jesus and are saved by grace through faith, right? They, they've confessed the Lord Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. They are saved through the gospel of Christ. Are there real Christians in the Catholic Church? Yes, but the leaders, when we're talking about sin, man, when the Bible teaches us something that we don't want to hear or corrects our theology about how we should think about God, his will, and his ways. Repentance must occur. I talk to, some, I talk to so many pastors who say, Brent, man, I wish I could do what you do at, at your church, but, but my people would never let me. Your people need correction. <laughs> right? If you know the truth, 
and you don't speak the truth to correct bad theology, to correct bad practice, then you are not doing God's work. We need the correction in this. Man, I'm praying that God will help people understand his word through these messages and correct bad theology and bad behavior. It's got to be corrected. That's why the book is written. Paul is this beautiful mess. These people are messy. They are suing one another. They're committing sexual immorality. Remember all that, w- that we've gone through. They're using the gifts wrongly. Uh, but God doesn't give up on them, but he does correct them so that they can use the gifts properly so the service can have an order to it and not be chaotic. We're going to see that at the end of chapter 14. Just like in creation, God brings order out of chaos. He wants the church to reflect that. The church shouldn't be chaotic. By the way, notice in chapter 14, all that we're reading, nobody has lost their mind. Nobody is out of control. They don't lose control of themselves. Like what you see in a lot of charismaniac services, people flopping on the floor like fish. People slang, you know, falling down because somebody touches their forehead. You don't see any of that in here. Correction for our bad behavior and our bad theology. Amen. We've all got to be on the same page. Verse 17. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the person beside you is not being built up. Pursue love. Don't do anything for yourself in the gathered corporate body of Christ. We should always be thinking about the person next to us. Did I finish the interpretation stuff? What you're going to hear out of an interpretation is is someone worshiping God. God, you are good. God, you alone are worthy of praise. You alone were able to unroll the scroll of revelation. You alone are worthy. I love you. Praise your name. That's what the interpretation should be. It should never be a a, a, a word to the church about their finances or you're going to get that building that you want to build or or just stick with me and we'll we'll make it through. It's, it's It's not horizontal. It's vertical always. And when that worship of God is interpreted, everybody can understand. And everyone is built up, not just the person who is speaking in the tongue. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul speaks in lots of tongues. But it's never, you don't see Paul anywhere in Scripture do it in a public worship service. Now, could it have happened? Maybe we don't have everything, but everything God did provide for us for our good, for our growth, for our maturity. You don't see Paul using the gift publicly ever, but we know he does. And we know he wishes all Christians spoke in tongues, although he he seems to understand uh, from uh, the end of chapter 12 that not everybody's going to, not everybody gets the gift. So if you're there and you're strong, reformed tradition, you're like, I don't want to talk about tongues anymore. Guess what? You'll probably never get the gift. Woo! You're clear. Not everybody, not everybody speaks in tongues. But clearly Paul does. And clearly he wants others to desire the gift. And clearly he uses the gift all the time. I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in church, when we come together, by the way, all you sitting on your couch eating Lucky Charms in your boxers, supposed to come together. We're supposed to gather together. Do not forsake. We are the visible temple of God in the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to be using our gifts to build one another up, mature one another so we can make much of Jesus. You can't do that at home in your PJs. Watch this next verse. Nevertheless, so I speak in tongues more than everybody, but in church, ecclesia, the gathered people, the gathered body of Christ, when we come together, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. When we come together in church, I think Paul's being pretty clear as he's correcting this church. You guys are using tongues way wrong and way too much in a service. When we come together, it's not about you and your gift. It's about all of us being built up. Five words everybody can understand is worth way more than 10,000 words you're speaking in tongues. That is 
That's the righteous right hand of God correcting his church. Stop making it all about you. Stop making it all about this gift is a gift that God gives, yes, but it's the least necessary of all the gifts. We can go, we can go our entire life and a tongue never be used with an interpretation in a public service and still be God glorifying, God honoring as we focus on his word and on more necessary gifts like prophecy and teaching. Amen? Least necessary. So when we come together, man, five words everybody understands is better than 10,000 words of tongues. I can just, I can see Paul writing this. Just stop it. Stop it. Verse 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. This is the third time we see Paul speak like this to the Corinthians. Chapter 4, verse 14, he refers to this church as his children. I mean, he was the apostle who was sent to Corinth and he planted the gospel. The church is there because of him. So Paul, Paul says, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual father to you and you are my children. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things behind me. Here in chapter 14, he says, don't be like, don't be like children in your thinking. Grow up is the message. Grow up, realize love's not proud, not arrogant. It doesn't boast. It's not all about you. So many churches, what's the message? It's a, so many churches, it's just a smorgasbord of goods and services uh, that are provided for people. People go to church for what the church can do for them. And, and man, when you're, you know, uh, Galatians 6 says, there are, there are times burdens get too big. And so we've got to help our brothers and sisters carry burdens. So, so there's a place for that. But, but church, we've got on our values outside, we've got four main values here at the church. The first one is god focus. We're not self-centered. We're not self-absorbed. It's not about us. We're not here for us. We don't sing to us. We don't pray to us. This is God's story that we get to be a part of. This is what God is doing in the world that we get to be a part of. Grow up in your thinking. It's not just about you and your gifts. Think about the person, the brother to the left, the sister to the right, so that we can all be unified in Christ Jesus and make much of him. Grow up in your thinking. This is the word of the Lord to his church 2,000 years ago, to his church today. We need his instruction. This grows us. This shows us where our thinking is wrong and corrects our thinking. So when our thinking is orthodox, when we think the right ways, orthopraxy occurs, the right behavior follows right thinking. Wrong thinking always leads to wrong behavior, amen? Amen. Come on, your parents, you know. But right thinking leads to right behavior. Grow up. Verse 21. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak, uh, will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So Paul now quotes from Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 through 12. Why does he bring the Old Testament into this, uh, this clearly New Testament gifting of tongues and interpretation because he wants people who are interrupting service with some tongue or they're singing in a tongue or praying in a tongue and nobody's interpreting so everybody can say amen. He wants uh, them to know exactly what they're doing. So he quotes Isaiah. The context of Isaiah chapter 28 is this. God is bringing judgment through foreign nations on his people because they have not obeyed his word. The northern kingdom experienced this first. Uh, we don't have time to go all the way back to, to Rehoboam and Jeroboam and the splitting of the nation of Israel into a northern kingdom where ten tribes uh, go and, and become a, a separate nation from uh, the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin and, and the Levites in Jerusalem. So we got two kingdoms uh, of Israel in the Old Testament. Assyria comes and destroys the northern kingdom. And that, and that kingdom never comes back. That's why we call those ten tribes the lost tribes of Israel. But about a hundred years later, even the southern kingdom experienced foreigners coming in, speaking foreign tongues, and took them over. Uh, uh, we read uh, um, Babylon comes to Jerusalem and takes over. This brings the exile 
Uh, we're studying Zechariah next year. We're going to talk a lot about this time in history where God is bringing his people back after the foreign powers have overtaken them. Uh, but in the book of Daniel, we read, when a foreign power overtakes a nation, everything changes. Their traditions change. The traditions now are all Babylonian. The language changes. They had to learn to speak Babylonian. Uh, the dress Changed. They had. They were had to dress like uh, the Babylonians. Did you know that uh, they even changed Daniel's name? Daniel's got this good Hebrew name. They said from now on you're going to be known as Belteshazzar, which is basically uh, if I changed your name, uh, Dan. If I if I came to you and said, Hey, listen, uh, I'm taking over your family, and uh, I'm going to change your name. You got to change everything about what you do, your diet, your language, your dress. And I'm, I'm going to change it. From now on, your name is going to be Lucifer. <laughs> That's basically what they did. They gave him the name of one of the pagan gods that the Babylonians served. That's what they did to Daniel. Gave him a name of a demon. And the, this foreign power, this foreign language of these uh, Assyria and Babylon and later Persia and the Greeks and Rome, this foreign language served to as a punishment for God's people because they didn't do what he told them to do. Anytime a foreign language is happening, it makes a person who doesn't speak that language, it makes them feel marginalized. It makes them feel out of touch, not in the loop. It makes them feel further away. And in church, what, what would that, a foreign language do? It makes a person who doesn't know the language feel farther away from God and what God is doing, which is why uh, he, after uh, quoting Isaiah chapter 28, he says this in verse 22. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Why would a tongue be a sign for unbelievers? Because it is a sign from Isaiah chapter 28. It, they are far away from God. They're not in the loop. They are marginalized. They're not saved. They're not part of the body of Christ. Paul is being very clear here. When you gather together as the church, do you not understand if you're just speaking in tongues and no interpretation and nobody knows what you're doing, you're actually speaking judgment? You're speaking God's wrath on the people who are listening in the room. You're making them feel further away from God which is a sign for unbelievers because unbelievers are far from God. People in the church who are known by God should never be alienated, should never be marginalized like that, should never uh, be pushed away to feel far from their God, their Savior, Jesus Christ. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. Now, does God use prophecy in unbelievers' life? Yes, we're going to talk about that in a second, but it's for believers. Why? Because why do we come? Why do we gather together? We do it to, to, to understand we're, we're bigger than just us. It edifies and encourages us when we come together. Man, wasn't this morning in worship beautiful? I love so much hearing Wade sing to the Lord. I love so much Jayla singing her heart out uh, to Jesus and, and, and these uh, men and women who lead us in worshiping and lifting up Jesus. It's a beautiful moment. It's beautiful times. But, but then we don't just come to worship. We come to hear from the Lord. And how can we hear from the Lord if it's not in the language that we speak? It's why prophecy is greater than tongues and interpretation. We need to hear what God says in our own language. So it's for believers to be built up, unified together, so that we can make much of Jesus in the world. If therefore, verse 23, I love this. Paul's so practical. It's like, look, guys, if somebody comes into your church, an outsider or an unbeliever, occasionally unbelievers show up in church. Amen? Amen. Especially if they have parents. <laughs> I had a drug problem when I was young. I got drugged to church every Sunday. Sunday morning. And back then it was three times a week. And sometimes prayer stuff on Mondays or Tuesdays. But Wednesday night service, Sunday morning service, and Sunday night service. You know when I started preaching, I was preaching three full messages every week. All different messages. Three of them a week. I don't know how I got everything done. Plus I was the guy cutting the church grass and everything else. Had no staff. 
Whoa. I'm thankful for you and four points. <laughs> Butch Harris, a guy who came to our church through an outreach event, cuts our grass, has been doing it for a long, long time. Thankful for his ministry, amen? What am I talking about? Oh, Paul. Paul says, guys, now and, and understand what an outsider is. An outsider can be a Christian who just is not part of that local body. Maybe they're traveling. Maybe they're just visiting from another church. There are outsiders in this room today. You're a Christian, but you are not known here, and we don't know you. So you would fall into the category. So our, if there are uh, outside believers, by the way, which, we don't want that you to be an outsider. It's why we have small groups. We, you, uh, when a church comes to get man, you need to be known by others, and you need to know others. That's how you become part of the life of the church. We've got amazing small groups. Please uh, try as many of them as you will until you find one where you can do life and fit in and talk about God's word with other Christian brothers and sisters. You will be encouraged. You will be edified. You will be built up. Don't stay an outsider. But in the church, there are always outsiders and unbelievers coming in to see what's going on with these people who call themselves God's people. And if they come in and all you're doing is speaking in tongues and singing in tongues and giving thanks to tongues, what are they going to think? They're going to think what each and every one of us would think if we went to that church. These people have lost their ever-loving minds. What is going on here? This is the Bible. Es la palabra de Dios. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? Of course they will, because that's weird. Don't be weird. I'm having a good time. <laughs> Verse 24. But if all prophesy, what is prophecy? We're going to talk about prophecy a lot next week. It is the supernatural gift of even if you don't know God's, uh, uh, if you don't know God's truth, it's the ability of, for, of God to put in you his truth and for you to rightly declare that to someone else in a way that they understand so that they, as, as well as you can, all, everyone can hear and be built up in the Lord Jesus, in the truth of his gospel, in the truth of his salvation, the church coming together in Jesus to make much of Jesus as we're built up in the gospel. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. When man, when God's word is spoken rightly, conviction occurs. Christians in this room, man, we, don't you, every time we open God's word, don't you get, don't you feel, it's not condemnation. Uh, condemnation is what happens to unbelievers because they're far from God. But we feel conviction. And, and an unbeliever can feel conviction too that would cause them to repent and turn to Jesus. That's all happened in our lives at some point in our lives to make us believers. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is good. It's when you know you're learning something. It's when you uh, know you're, you're peering more deeply into the heart of God, into his sovereign will and his sovereign purpose for your life as part of his body that makes much of Jesus. When God's word is rightly spoken, that's why prophecy is a greater gift. When God's word is rightly spoken, we are convicted by the Holy Spirit. We repent, are repenting of sin. We're saying, God, help me live better. Help me uh, have more right thinking, so, which will lead me to more right living. Not only does it convict, but it also calls us to account. Man, don't you love? And I know we live in this political, divisive world at the moment. And it's amazing. Isn't it amazing how people spin gold out of complete nonsense, utter nonsense? It's Politicians can just spin it, man. They can spin it. Yarn into gold. But when truth is spoken, God's truth, lies are clearly seen, and we are held accountable to what is true. That's why I love, if you haven't seen uh, What is a Woman with Matt Walsh, 
Man, he's sitting down talking to these doctors who are all about women can become men and, and men can become women. And he just, he just lays down some truth about male and female and chromosomes and gender. And they just stand there like idiots, not knowing what to say. That's what truth does. That's why we need God's word spoken where we can hear because it brings accountability. One of my favorite books growing up was Lord of the Flies. And, and if you don't know the book, just real quick, it's a bunch of kids uh, that, that ha- have a plane wreck and all the adults are gone. Uh, and it's just kids on this desert island all by themselves. And kids do whatever kids want to do. And quickly, this civilized boys' school, you know, this reformed boys' school where they all wear suits and they all know the rules. Well, the rules just go out the window and these kids are living however they want to live. And pretty soon, within a matter of weeks, you got pig heads on spikes and just crazy nonsense going on. And there's a a couple kids. At the end of the book, there's just one kid left who remembers what is true, who remembers the rules. Uh, And the other kids, guess what? They hate that kid. They've killed all the other kids who are on the side of truth like he is. And now he's running for his life at the end of the book because he's speaking what's true, but nobody else wants to hear what's true. So they're running after him so they can kill him too. And at, the, and at the end of that book, and if you've seen the movie, it's just so awesome. The kid's running for his life, and then he falls on the ground, and he looks up, and right there, the adults are on the island again. They found the boys. They found the wreckage, and adults have come back onto the island. And the boy who falls on the ground running for his life looks up and sees the adult, and he starts crying because he knows he's saved. And the other boys, as they're running after him, they stop. They see the adults. They drop their spears because immediately accountability just showed up. Truth is true, whether you've pushed it away or swept it under the rug. Truth is still truth, and with truth comes accountability. Those boys at the end of that movie, they realize they have done so wrong, and accountability always comes. My dad used to tell me, Brent, sin will take you farther than you want to go, will cost you more than you want to pay, and will keep you longer than you want to stay. And Brent, know this, payday, you might be getting away with it right now, but payday always comes. And I lived for years thinking my dad was an idiot. (laughs) But the older I get, the smarter my dad becomes. And payday did come. Payday always comes. God's word not only convicts us of sin, when we can hear it in our language, but it brings accountability to us. The secrets of our heart are disclosed. We realize our thinking that is wrong, our motivations that are wrong when we hear God's truth. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God really is among you. When we can hear what God says, we can hear his truth and understand it. Prophecy is greater than tongues. So here's where we end, verses 26 through 28. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, right? And the, and the churches of the New Testament churches 2,000 years ago, listen, we, we do very little like what they did back then. Uh, the New Testament church was modeled after the synagogue. Synagogue is a square room. Uh, where Jews come together. Now, there were rabbis. There were only certain people who could unroll the scrolls of the Old Testament and teach from the lectern. But in the square room, there was three uh, benches around three walls. That's where all the important people sat. That's what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, oh, you love your special seats, don't you? He's talking to those those snooty, high-minded people. We're we're the best people. We get the best seats. Everybody else sat on the floor and there was, there was open times. It was kind of like a Quaker service in the synagogue. Somebody could share a word. Somebody could share a testimony. Somebody could share a prayer request. Somebody was like, hey, I feel like singing this song. You got to sing this song with me. It, it was kind of chaotic like that. Understand, we are living in 2,000 years of Christian maturity. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Think, think about that. Think about how smooth and orderly our church services are today uh, in light of the chaos that that some of these churches were experiencing in the first century, which is whatever anybody wanted to do. Hey, uh, God gave me the gift to come, so I'm going to see me tie my bow tie. Everybody listen to me. (laughs) Econolodge. If you grew up Pentecostal, you'd get all that. 
So what then? Everybody's coming together. Think, pursue love. Think about the people beside you. What is going to build up everybody at the same time so that we can make much of Jesus? Let all things be done for building up. And then Paul says, now if a tongue, because this is a church that speaks in tongues a lot. So Paul knows behavior is not going to be corrected immediately. He knows they're going to have a hard time with this. So he lays out very clear rules. Tongues should not take up a large part of the service. Maybe one, two, and because three is such an important number in Hebrew. He says three at the most. You know, two witnesses is good to convict. Three witnesses is better. All right, that's all Hebrew understanding. He says if a tongue is used in a public gathered service, here's the way it should look. If anyone speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. And each in turn, they shouldn't be talking over themselves. Each in turn, oh, where did I go? Let there be a two or at most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. Now, again, from verse uh, 13, you better pray that you can interpret. Because if you can't interpret a tongue that you speak in a gathered worship service and nobody else has an interpretation for it either, then you have done wrong. <laughs> You are in the wrong. Uh, Let's two or three, each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and use the gift where it should be used between you and God when you're by yourself in your prayer closet. You can worship God with tongues uh, and you will be edified. But in church, it's about all of us, not just you. So if you do speak in a tongue in a public worship service and no one interprets, sit down and shut up. I thought I'd get more than uh, uh, amen. Amen. So be it. Yes, this is true. Brothers and sisters, I leave you with this. I don't know where you're at or what your thinking is. Most of our thinking, most of our theology comes from religious traditions that we grow up in. But God's word corrects all things. And ultimately, remember this. This is not anything we have to draw swords and fight about. right? Because there are going to be people who pray in tongues in heaven... There are going to be cessationists who believe that gift stopped 2,000 years ago. They're going to be in heaven because how do we get to heaven and what is the main thing? The main thing is God saves sinners. Jesus Christ died, lived perfect, died in our place for our sins. Remember this as you move into your small groups. Somebody may have a different way of looking at tongues and interpretation uh, than you do, but you don't have to strangle each other. Jesus Christ saves cessationists. Jesus Christ saves continuationists. But this is the word of the Lord and you have to do something with it. Be corrected by it. Be encouraged by it. Let's all be built up together in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for hard texts. I thank you for hard sermons. God, we need every ounce, every inch of your word. Thank you for convicting us. Thank you for holding us accountable to your truth. May we leave here more in love with you and better men and women of God than we were when we walked in. It is in Jesus' name every Christian said.